As everyone is healing up from the bug cave fiasco, we have a prison break. Newbert just kind of smashes through the wall with his bare hands. I'll be honest, the thought of this happening did not occur to me. So we wrangle up the escapees, replace the wood walls with stone, and get them back in the prison. Unfortunately, we do lose Kamboa, the tribal with the combat passions. Unfortunate. Sam's death rest research finishes, and we queue up everything we need for gunsmithing. The pit starts rumbling. Oh, right, I forgot about that. And we prepared to greet our fleshy guests. But not before the local wildlife tries to hunt them. Well, good luck, little Dusk Prowler. Godspeed. So the trap maze is starting to feel really cheesy. I mean, I'm still going to abuse it for the rest of this run, but I think in the next RimWorld series we'll try a higher threat level and or a more open base design, because nothing really stands a chance getting through this. However, we do manage to capture a tough spike. And oh, looky there, even more shamblers. Except these ones are a bit more aggressive than the past, and they don't really care about the death maze. These shamblers just smash through the wooden wall. Cleeper tanks them like a boss. But Reggie gets knocked over, and Kepler has some wounds as well. Overall, the successful defense. The boys get patched up. During that time, Newbert gets recruited. So welcome aboard, Newbert. Glad to have you. Newbert and AA start cutting stone blocks because we are running very low, and we also start expanding bedrooms along the eastern wall. This one goes to Reggie. Well, remember last episode how I said I couldn't figure out how the hygiene water boilers work? Well, I figured it out now. You use these increase and reduce power buttons to get the connected capacity to equal the demand. Maybe if I had a thermostat somewhere it would automatically adjust it? I don't know, I never built one. As it turns out, these guys suck up a lot of power. So we need to throw down our second geothermal generator, which means we also need to mine more steel. Fortunately, this map comes with a lot of compacted steel. Another entity escape. And our stock is dwindling again. But man, imagine having secure security doors. Like, I have to imagine these things are bio-coded, and the idea that stuff can just walk through them is kind of absurd in my opinion. Thank you, mods. So I've realized that it takes a lot of wood to keep rearming traps, but the Fortification Neolithic mod has cavalry spikes that you just build and never have to rearm. I also replaced this double door with walls because that's just a big old structural weakness and we don't do that here. The cavalry spikes work pretty well. Exhibit A. It does nothing to the boulder mitt, however. Then again, not much at all does anything to boulder mitts. It is time to say farewell to Matchill. He's been a real sport about his whole imprisonment, attempted escape, re-imprisonment, loss of organs, and loss of blood. But now it's time for the final harvest. Thank you for your organs and blood, Matchill. Dr. Amphibian and Mr. Samuel appreciate you. Ah, yes. Calvary spikes are wood, and so is that palisade embrasure. Hmm. I'll have to do something about that in the future, but we don't have the research for it just yet. Sam gets his death rest coffin at the start of the second year, as well as a death rest accelerator. Now, when he has to go into death rest, it should only take about three days instead of four. Speaking of Sam, it is time to build again. Our first new building since the hospital, and we get a wanderer joining us. Who could it be? Why, it's V! 
EQ the turtle, uh, also a Sorid. Double combat passions and a double construction passion. Welcome aboard VQ, a pleasure indeed. The new building is going to be a mechanitor lab for Hazor, and we immediately queue up a clean sweeper, agrahand, and lifter. Our bedroom expansion continues, and the newest one goes to Newbert, followed by a bedroom for VQ. Sorry, Mila and Kepler, you are both side characters. Feels bad, man. We have finished gunsmithing, and that means it is time for microelectronics. At last. A combat supplier comes through, and Hazor goes to see what they have. We trade Match Hill's heart and some drugs for this incinerator and 960 silver. Hazor equips the incinerator. Hazor likes the incinerator. Equipped with the aforementioned incinerator, Hazor gathers a team to go explore the pit gate. Descending into its fleshy maw, we are greeted with... Well, not much. A lot of flesh bulbs providing light, which is nice. There's a single tough spike, but AA shows why they aren't very tough with a single blast from his shotgun. Cleeper further shows us why these creatures really need to be renamed to something without the word tough in it, because it's really kind of misleading, isn't it? AA carries the fallen tough spike to the surface for containment, as we are very low on containment entities, and Hazor just can't wait to test out his new incinerator. He does vaporize a finger spike though, so good job, Hazor. Then it's just Hazor and Kleeper, so they go around exploring, beating some flesh walls, and just poking around a bit to see what's down here. The answer to that is not much. Not until Hazor opens an area with more tough spikes. Cleeper takes point, and Hazor is really able to let loose with the incinerator, which now catches the flesh floor on fire, and we get a good look at what's up ahead. Try spikes and more tough spikes. It looks a bit overwhelming for just the two of them, so they head back to the surface to let the fire burn out and gather some backup. I add some more platforms in anticipation for more entities to contain, and we receive a notification that our expectations are high enough now to desire an ideological form. A special statue, basically. At first I have no idea what this is, so we just eat the mood penalty for a while. I thought it was this ideogram, so we build an entire church. Sadly, it is time to harvest the harbinger trees because they're in my farmland space and people still don't like looking at corpses. Not to worry, however, they'll pop up again somewhere. Spring has fully sprung and it is time for Sam to go into death rest in his brand new death rest casket. I'm sure he's thrilled. I noticed we don't have enough power for the death rest accelerator, so that means another geothermal generator. As we are constructing the third geothermal generator, we are harassed by a site stealer. No idea why it's here, but sure, thanks for the donation to my containment facility. And it's right about here that I find out the ideogram is, in fact, not an ideological form. My confusion is absolutely palpable. It's not until I check the bills for this lathe that I noticed what it is. It's just a sculpture. So I queue a couple of them up to put in the church, and Newbert gets on it straight away. A proximity detector does a wonderful job of detecting, so we gather the squad and see what awaits us. Dang it, you leave that clean sweeper alone! Hey, stop that right now! Oh geez, they're just everywhere. Fortunately, they're just sight stealers, so I mean it's not a real threat unless you're a clean sweeper, as you can clearly see. So Hazor fixes up the bots and everyone gets back to work. 
We have a bioferrite shaper now, so we can get to work on a nerve spiker and some ceremonial hoods, just as the disruptor flare research finishes. Good. Very good. And we are almost finished with ghoul enhancements. Yes! We need precision rifling for bioferrite weaponry, so we queue that up and good lord, more sight stealers attacking my robots. Or Hazor's robots, I guess. So we assemble the Avengers for two sight stealers, and I think Hazor is starting to enjoy that incinerator a little too much. We start carting off the sight stealers to harvest their bioferrite, and Hazor just kind of lights the place on fire, including Reggie. Ah, oh, well, these things happen. Back to our containment facility, it's full. Actually full. I mean, the variety isn't great, but come on, it's full. Why, hello there, fellow cultists. These fellas are gonna try and skip abduct one of my colonists? Well, well, well. Allow me to introduce you to Kleeper and the boys. And oh look! Hazor is here now! Purge them, Hazor! Purge the unclean and purifying flame! For the Emperor! Ooh, okay, well, that took a turn. I think I'm starting to like the incinerator too. We capture who we can and pull Dr. Amphibian out of the fire. After the fighting, two prisoners managed to survive. Klomster von Bismarck, what a name, is a very meh pawn and will probably be used as a blood bag slash organ donor. The other is Kaito Zonadrite, another great name, and has 10 shooting double passion and 20 mining double passion. This one, we recruit. The containment facility is almost at maximum capacity, which is very nice. We'll have to consider construction of a separate prison complex soon. And Reggie is extremely unhappy. Well, take a day, my man. Go relax. But instead of doing either one of those, he has a tantrum instead. Well, as long as he doesn't smash up anything valuable, I think we're fine. Tantrum away, Reggie. Get it out. We have Disruptor Flare Packs now, so we queue some of those up. They will be essential as things start to get weirder. And oh, things will be getting weirder. I see a big old red and sufficient containment on the screen, and we have some shards, so I dropped down a couple of shard inhibitors, but I'm just a little bit too late, and whoopsie. There goes a big old entity escape. So we gather up the squad and this is starting to get just a little bit dangerous. Mila goes down, so it's just Cleaver and Reggie holding the last entity. Yes! Thank you, Hazor! I think it's been handled! Good grief. Great, now the whole place is on fire. So I hold the doors open and beat out the fire. And oh, oh wow, that is a very high temperature in that room. And VQ has had just about enough of this as well. It has been a very stressful day, I understand. I think it's about time we start switching out those wooden floors for bioferrite plate. So we recapture the entities that are still alive, and everyone needs a doctor after that, and the only one with any skill that hasn't been knocked over is Sam, who quite literally just woke up from death rest to the Inferno facility. We lost one of the metal horrors during all of that, which is disappointing, but I'm sure we'll find something else just as terrifying in good time. 
Continuing the trend of mental breaks, Sam goes and kills one of the sight stealers, and I'm just happy it wasn't the other metal horror at this point. Being set on fire twice in one day is too much for AA, and he goes into a schizophrenic episode. That is a lot of mental breaks. I'm feeling a little stressed out too, so I follow this relaxing clean sweeper as it goes about its business for a little bit. Appreciating its simple existence and just cleaning the floors. Good on you, little clean sweeper. Oh, would you look at that? Ghoul enhancements just finished. Unfortunately, between the Bioferrite floor and the new anomaly weapons, it'll be a while before we can explore those. We queue up Ghoul Resurrection next, just in case. And it looks like we finished our first Nerve Spiker. The honor of the first one goes to AA. I am looking forward to trying this out. Maybe a return to the Flesh Pit soon? Sam finishes the ideological form, and finally we can get rid of that mood debuff. So we put it in what will eventually be the church, and wouldn't you know it, it's being disrespected. Because we haven't had enough time to cut marble blocks in between the flesh pit, sight stealers, cultists, escaping entities, and Hazor setting the bloody base on fire. So I drop more wood floors, because, you know, that hasn't gone terribly wrong already. But hey, our boys can floor an entire church in less than a day using wooden floors, so I'm not gonna complain. Then I look at our food stores and, ooh, that's not good. All we have is a bunch of insect meat, and that's for Cleeper. Also emergencies, but mostly for Cleeper. So it's time to hunt the entire map. Please hold. And at long last, the church is finished. No more ideological form desired. No more ideological form disrespected. Moods are still looking a bit rough, but that'll sort itself out when we get lavish meals and some beer back in the colony. A muffalo goes Manhunter, and it's a duel between Dr. Amphibian and the muffalo. So the nerve spiker stuns biological targets, kinda like an EMP stuns mechanoids. Unlike an EMP, however, the Nerve Spiker does damage. And the Muffalo goes down. Well played, Dr. Amphibian. Our food stockpile is suddenly looking very attractive. I mean, not literally, it's a bunch of frozen animal corpses in there, but in terms of food for the colony, like... Ooh. Newbert's on a food binge, and it looks like Mila's up next, but maybe she can hold it together. We relocate the ritual spot out of the farms and up in this empty bit of field west of the church. It is time to provoke the void. It's been so busy lately, we just haven't really had time. But the void is calling Hazor, and he must respond. Oh, new Harbinger Trees! I knew they'd be back. And a successful Void Provocation. The Void is pleased. So we set up a new Corp stockpiles at the Harbinger Trees, and what is that? An overgrown Colossus! Holy moly. Well, you just chill over there, okay, buddy? And the Void blesses us with... a Warped Obelisk. Of course, we toggle study on and whatever automatic suppression means, because that can only be a good thing. Hazor goes out to immediately start studying the strange construct. A Garanlin pod sprouts that I will forget about entirely, and we also get some donkeys that randomly join. I am not too interested in ranching or caravanning this playthrough, so unfortunately they get slaughtered for meat. The pit starts rumbling again and more friends show up. A lot of friends, in fact. Look at all of them. So gather the squad together and get into position and dang it, leave my robots alone. No, not lifter one. Ah, great. Now they're in the base through the side door. 
So literally everyone gets pulled off of the wall to handle the flood of fleth. Everyone gets pulled off of the wall to handle the flood of flesh beasts caused by a broken robot holding the door open. And what should have been a nice straightforward showdown devolves into absolute chaos. After extinguishing the map, we gather up Sam, AA, Hazor, Kleeper, and Newbert, and make our return to the Flesh Pit. The Flesh Beasts have spread out a bit since our last visit, but this really just makes them easier to clear out. Flame away, Hazor! Flame away! We come across a Flesh Sack that is the name, I didn't make that up. Inside, we find a dead guy. And inside that dead guy, we find goodies. It's like a disgusting Matroshka doll filled with treats, like a heavy SMG in Go Juice, which is basically just Yorsh with extra steps. So we strip the dead guy and keep clearing out flesh walls until we get another flesh pod. This one just has a flak helmet in it. We give to Sam and move along, clearing out flesh walls and finger spikes as we come across them. Here we take a little break to let the lads have a meal and rest a bit. As a psychopath, I give AA the tainted flak vest and marine helmet. Sam decides to mine steel for whatever reason, ever the industrialist I suppose, and beats down a tough spike on the way. I send a few of the boys over to help because I'm far too cautious for my own good, and there we call it a day. We head back up to the surface and vow to return to clear it out for good soon. Word reaches VQ about the heavy SMG just laying down there, so he goes to claim it while the others are resting. He also grabs the Go Juice, another flak vest, and this tough spike for bioferrite harvesting. We've reached a breakthrough in the warped obelisk. It seems that it is an arco-technological device that seems to interact with organic creatures at a distance. It's probably a piece of a much larger arcotech structure that was destroyed or broken apart long ago. The machinery at its core is inhumanly complex and frighteningly powerful. Its purpose and method of action remain totally mysterious. If not suppressed, its activity level will increase over time. We can't tell what will happen when the device fully activates. So yeah, if you didn't know to suppress the artifact before reaching this level of study, chances are your obelisks have activated early, like mine did in my test playthrough. Imagine that. I enjoy living on the edge, however, and set it to 70%, which gives me about a day and a half margin of error. Risky. As if in response to uncovering a secret of the monolith, the Void sends us Chimera. Void touch twisted monstrosities of a bear and some other creature smashed together and filled with rage. Not too spooky, all things considered, just extra angry wildlife. We finished Ghoul Resurrection, and now I kind of feel lost when it comes to the advanced research. I don't really actively use combat enhancements like the serums, although this would have been an excellent opportunity to expand my active gameplay decisions, but honestly I'm so overwhelmed with the base DLC and the mods that it never really crosses my mind. Maybe in a future series I can fully take advantage of what's available to me. So we set the research to Void Sculptures and move along. We move right along to this group of child vagabonds spawning literally on top of the Chimera. Cassandra, how could you do this? Two of them do manage to make it off the map, but now the Chimera are pissed and have to take the long way around to the front gate. The first one goes down and... Blah, clean sweeper 2, what are you doing out there? 
This reminds me to put the rest of the bots in a safe zone. Requiescat in pace, little robot. That means rest in peace. Congrats, now you know Latin. Go impress random people on Reddit or Twitter. Unfortunately, it's raining, or I imagine Hazor's incinerator would be doing some massive damage against these things. And my cavalry spikes. But the rest go down and one manages to survive for containment. Happy days. We then get some non-aggressive shamblers that'll just kind of hang around for a while, and this drifter named Blair. Her stats are dog water, but the double passion in shooting can be trained up pretty quick. Also, she can transmute steel. Oh, -ho! how interesting. Sam goes to have a chat with the drifter and welcomes her on board. It is time to expand bedrooms once again along the northern mountain now that we've run out of room in the east, and we start cleaning up the stockpile by adding shelves. Also, we test out Blair's transmute steel. I fully expect something anomalous to happen, but we just get uranium. Cool. I have no idea what to do with uranium, though. And look at the time. Is that some more void provocation? It sure is. Uh-oh. The void didn't like that one. Bit of a nap time, bro, Hazor. BQ gets his own bedroom with smooth stone floors and walls and three whole limestone tiles. Enjoy. AA's mood is looking a bit low, so I look into why that is, and I am incredibly confused as to why the psychopath cares about tainted apparel. Oh, I have him drop the flak vest and marine helmet and queue up a kidney removal from good old Klompster. That he fails. Well, that sucks for Klompster, because we're trying again. And just like that, Dr. Amphibian is feeling great. A Timberwolf tries hunting Mila, and that's just a mistake. I send Kleeper out for assistance, but he's really not needed here. Mila handles the situation just fine on her own, a truly underrated colonist. Oh, back into the flesh pit we go. We brought the starting colonist with us, and it's pretty smooth sailing. We find another flash sec, and oh my! That is a doomsday rocket launcher. I have Sam pick it up for safekeeping, and Hazor immediately sets him on fire. No, Hazor, you cannot have the Doomsday Rocket Launcher. I am specifically keeping it away from you in particular. What a jerk. So Sam's down from extreme pain because he was ignited on fire. So we just keep lighting more stuff on fire, and since Hazor knocked Sam down, he gets to haul him back up to the surface. We take another break while the fires burn out and build a secure weapons locker for things like a Doomsday Rocket Launcher. Blair transmutes some more steel slag into uranium, and I'm still not sure what to do with all of this uranium I'm getting. I'm sure we'll figure something out, though. It's about time that we queue up the ghoul enhancements. Ghoul plating, ghoul barbs, and I go for a corrosive heart because I want to test out how good the corrosive spit is. Sam's feeling better now, so back into the pit we go. More flesh walls get set on fire, and this time we keep the melee pawns away from the fire. This works out pretty well. Another flesh sack, and oh my lord, a legendary void sculpture. Truly, a gift from the Void itself. So Hazor, who has no fear of the purifying flame, dashes in to grab it before it's incinerated. What a boon for the colony indeed. Sam's just about had it with all this fire, however, and we decide to move on to a different part of the caves. So Hazor starts doing his thing when, holy Jesus, what is that? We open up a room and inside is a flesh beast dreadmeld. It appears to have a psychic connection to the flesh mass that supports the cavern. Killing it may destabilize the whole system. Well, sure, whatever you say. Regroup lads, pull back, let the fire purify this foul creature. And oh great, it leaks. Flesh beasts. We corner it, and that is a lot of fire. 
and a lot of finger spikes. And we pull back and this is where things start to get pretty chaotic. Finger spikes are just falling off of this thing. Hazor is trying to keep distance because the incinerator doesn't fire if things are too close. AA is in melee range and now we've got tri spikes falling off. AA is down, Sam's on fire again. Now Sam's down. Fortunately, we managed to get the fire out. So we grab the downed lads and make for the surface while calling for backup from Kepler, Newbert, VQ, and Blair. Ho, oh, except Cleeper can't carry colonists to safety, so he just stands near AA as a bodyguard while Hazor hauls Sam to the surface. Again. Backup arrives just as the Dreadmeld starts advancing on our position, and Blair holds it off in single combat while Kepler uses his weird healing on AA, cause this is a bit of an emergency. More flesh beasts erupt from the Dreadmeld and we fall back, except for Blair, who's caught in melee combat and surrounded. Flesh beasts are coming from everywhere, and Blair is down. Kepler's on fire and surrounded by flesh beasts, but the lads manage to clear him out. And AA, Kepler, VQ, and Blair all down, leaving Newbert and Hazor to try and get everyone up to the surface. This is an all hands on deck situation. Cleeper squishes a finger spike that was heading for VQ, and up on the surface, Sam is bleeding out in 8 hours, Kepler's bleeding out in 8 hours, V is bleeding out in 14, and Blair's bleeding out in 5. So Newbert quickly grabs Blair, and fortunately, the Dreadmeld doesn't notice or doesn't care. Cleeper stands guard over V while Reggie comes to rescue him. Back on the surface, Blair is bleeding out in 4 hours, but Sam is up again. So I try to get him over to the pit gate to coagulate Blair, but he throws a tantrum instead. This is not the time, Samuel. Blair is bleeding out in 3 hours, and Newbert is incapable of medical, so Reggie and Newbert trade. Newbert rescues V, who's bleeding out in 12, and Reggie starts tending to Blair with no medicine. Mila has better medical skills than Reggie, so she drafts up to take over for him while Reggie does his best to save Blair. When Mila takes over, Blair has two hours, and suddenly, the ground shakes. The undercaves have become unstable. The Dreadmeld must have bled out as well. A shame about all the loot we're missing out on, but we have bigger concerns right now. Blair's bleeding out in an hour. Mila is doing her best, but Blair already has an infection. Half an hour. Point four hours. Point three hours, ten seconds, five, four, three, two, one, and she's gone. Just like that, she's gone. Mila was so close, just one last tend, and she would have been saved. We've lost our first colonist. Blair wasn't with us long, but she was still a member of this colony. A true shame. I queue up a slate sarcophagus for her in the northern mountain. Her sacrifice allowed the rest of the squad to escape the flesh cavern alive. Moods are low, apparel is tattered, but we conquered the flesh cavern and the dreadmeld. We will recover, and we will grow stronger because of this. As we are recovering from the flesh cave and the dreadmeld, I notice we're running low on components. So I use the base game search function by pressing Z, or Z for the lads across the pond, and proceeding to mine every last bit of compacted machinery on the map. Of which, there is a lot. We extend the roads to the hospital and start queuing up some smoothing around what will be the tomb when the final study of the warped obelisk finishes. As it turns out, the warped obelisk can warp someone to a labyrinth within the void plane. No, not that kind of plane. You'll see in a little bit, we still need to finish recovering first. Oh, speaking of recovering, that infection does not look good on Sam. Maybe if you were resting instead of smashing up a geothermal generator, this wouldn't happen. So Sam goes into death rest, and he's out for a few days and loses a bunch of XP in melee. That's fine though, melee gets trained up faster than any other skill. Blair's been buried, and this sarcophagus is engraved with an illustration of Norma Blair Grimshaw sitting in quiet contemplation 
reflecting on the profound truths within Rex's sloppy studies under the soft glow of a reading lamp. Blair's eye sparkles with newfound wisdom. A teacher off to one side represents the artist's distance. This representation refers to Blair finishing Rex Sloppy's studies on the 8th of Jugist, 5501. Truly, a work of art from Newbert. Thank you, Newbert. Because of the events in the Flesh Caves and maybe a little bit of the Void's influence, Hazor develops an obsession with the purifying flame. He becomes a pyromaniac. The purifying flame is all the cleansing he needs, however, and forsakes his good hygiene in order to further embrace the flame. Also, he seemed to be the only one having a good time down there. Oh, hello there! A Galatross wanders in, basically the alpha animal's version of a thrumbo. As you can see, it does not care at all about the cavalry spikes. Please don't eat my entire farm. And we have a whole lot of beer. We can pour one out for Blair. Also, we're working on ceremonial hoods for everyone. Mila here is looking great in her cloth ceremonial hood and parka. Work it, girl. And here we have Kepler, likewise in a cloth ceremonial hood, but what looks like a camel skin duster. Very fitting for the summer. And no summer would be complete without a plague. Today I learned the plague is specifically an infectious disease caused by the Yersinia pestis bacteria, usually found in small mammals and their fleas. I always thought a plague was like a classification of diseases, but I guess it just refers to the one. Wild. What's also wild is how we keep getting flesh beasts. I am so sick of flesh beasts. Fortunately, there's only a few of them, and I think the cavalry spikes will do the majority of the heavy lifting here. But just in case, I brought along Hazor AA and Hazor's first Militor. Look at this little guy. As I expected, the cavalry spikes just tear through the flesh beast, so everyone goes undrafted and goes about whatever they were doing. The void giveth, and the void also giveth even more. An ambrosia sprout. Right in the base, too. How fortuitous. And there is your word for the day. Fortuitous. It's a pretty good one. So what happens if a death-resting vampire dies again? Sam's immunity gain is just awful, and I think it might be because of his sickly trait. That's a 70% tend, my guy. I'm not sure why his immunity gain is so bad. Compare to VQ whose immunity is massively better, with only a 22% tent. But his immunity finally overtakes the plague, and I think we're in the clear. A turkey goes manhunter, and I don't know in what universe a robot is considered a man, but this turkey sure thinks it is. Mila handles it, and I specifically make sure we have this turkey for supper. And finally, a reason for celebration. We have just finished microelectronics. We drop down plans for our first high-tech research bench and a solar flare. Nice. Oh, and I guess we have not been suppressing that warped obelisk, so Reggie is starting to fade away now. That's just great. So Sam activates the monolith and goes to retrieve Reggie, and oh, this is different. This must be the labyrinth in the void plane, right? So we can force open these doors, but that takes forever. Fortunately, we have two in here, so things should go pretty quickly once they meet up. Or it would if Sam could hold it together. Fortunately, the room that Sam is hiding in seems to be pretty safe. Well, it's up to you now, Reggie. The first door reveals rotting corpses, my favorite. Reggie deciphers some floor etchings, and there's some spooky scribblings that indicate the exit is somewhere north of this room. Well, that's great, but I would like to link up with Sam first. So Reggie moves south of the corpse room into another corpse room. This time, the body is humanoid, so we strip it for its valuables, naturally. 
and ooh, this fella had some good stuff. Reggie grabs the chain shotgun as a sidearm, thank you Simple Sidearms mod. The fine meals, the go juice, and the yayu, just to be prepared. Also, if we survive this, we can sell the go juice and yayu. In the room to the west, we come across a bunch of boxes. So Reggie opens them all and, ah, I guess it's nap time first. Well, okay then, buddy, take your nap. Sam's still wandering around aimlessly, and I'll just skip to when Reggie wakes up. Good morning! So we get a shard, very nice, a couple of skulls, and some organs. Thanks, box room! So Reggie works on opening the door to where Sam is when we get a mech cluster. No, not here, in back, back at the main base. And oh, it's pretty weak. It has a psychic suppressor affecting females, and well, we used to have two, but now it's just Mila. Bit of a sausage fest to this playthrough. It is very difficult to find women RimWorld YouTubers making recent content. I tried looking. They are more rare than thrombos. Anyway, the countdown activator doesn't go off for another three days, and I think that's enough time to get the boys out of the labyrinth. So back in we go. Reggie gets Sam's door open and starts working on the next door to the north. We get another corpse room with a weird statue in the middle. And of course, the statue sprays out dead life dust. Reggie strips the corpse and, ew, gross, a bio-coded heavy SMG. Garbage. Reggie hangs out near Sam, who's still on a mental break, but the corpses just kind of stay in their room. Sure, I'm fine with this. Reggie goes to work on the next door. We find another corpse and box, and I think all of these corpses are getting to Reggie, who starts vomiting on the corpse duster. We get a tome, some simple meals, and a pistol out of this room. On to the next. Reggie's vomiting again, and I'm looking for a reason, but I can't see anything in the needs menu, and aside from his asthma, missing fingers, and a bite scar, there's nothing on the health menu either. I guess it's gotta be nerves and the corpses, I suppose. I give the poor man a short break for a meal and a breather before we try the door again. Sam's finally snapped out of it, so I have him take over while Reggie takes a nap. I'm just making my way north because of what those spooky scribbles said. We find a box with an awful book in it, another box with two metal blood serums that Sam picks up, more statues with corpses, a psychic animal pulsar in this box, a non-bio-coded heavy SMG on this corpse, and not much else until Sam finds the exit monolith here in the northwest. We open the last two boxes, take the shards, and everyone involved is very done with Giant Grey Labyrinth. Reggie has a schizophrenic episode, and Sam has decided it is time to go. So he activates the monolith, and everyone gets transported back home. Except Reggie got transported way the heck over here in the middle of his mental break. Nice. At least he didn't pop out on top of the mechanoids. Since Sam and Reggie are back, our next plan is to take out the mechanoids just south of the base. Azor has a little fleet of three Militors along with Sam, AA, Cleeper, and Joris. There's no proximity sensor, so we take out the cannon first. We split our forces with Sam, Cleeper, and the Militors focusing down the Scorcher and the rest going for the Lancer. It is here that I realize fire does nothing to mechanoids. However, an angry polar bear is pretty good at smashing up mechanoids. And of course, Hazor sets Joris on fire. He'll be okay though. We start smashing up the psychic suppressor before ultimately letting the fire take care of it. Everyone goes home to recover. Well, that's part two, everyone. I hope you enjoyed. This was originally going to be a three-part series, but this is just barely through the halfway point in my footage, so it'll probably end up being a four-part series instead. Huge thanks for all the subs, likes, and comments on the last video. This is my first high-effort project, and I really enjoy making this style of content. Stay tuned for part three, coming next week, probably. <laughs>